which is inconvenient when everything's copied at this point. <laughs> Uh, from uh, USA 
So tell us about how you become involved with the free software and uh, the fact that you don't need to have prior technical skills in order to help uh, the free software movement. Welcome. Thank you. I appreciate the warm welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, I very much want to say thanks to all the volunteers that put this event on. Uh, it's a great thing to have people that care about freedom and care about free software uh, willing to take time and, and money to uh, spread the, the good news to other people. and. Uh, that's really what I think free software is all about, is community. And uh, I, so far, after uh, being here yesterday, uh, and, and I'm sure the rest of the day today, uh, at the best thing about this whole event has been the people. And so thanks for coming, and thanks for everyone that, that put this up. Uh, so my name is Curtis Hanna. I'm from uh, Iowa and Minnesota in the US. And I've never been to Romania before, just got here two days ago, and I'm really enjoying myself. But uh, to the talk that I wanted to give today is titled Escape from Free Software. And fundamentally, it's a story about freedom. And I wanted to start the talk off by uh, telling a bit of a, a story about how I got involved with free software and started caring about freedom in general. So when I, uh, probably about eight years ago, I personally was a, arrested in the United States. Uh, I had uh, cannabis on my possession and because of that, I was told by the state of Iowa that I potentially was going to be spending up to 10 years in a cell. And so freedom became very important to me <laughs> at that point in time. Uh, so I was uh, charged with two felonies, uh, both up to five years in jail uh, apiece. And yes, freedom became a, a very relevant issue at the time. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have been able to take into account uh, or to have been able to exercise the freedom that is in the United States Constitution related to the illegal search and seizure of property, the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. And I, uh, if, if you're unfamiliar, the, the concept is that you, as a U.S. citizen, should not uh, be subject to a search unless there is a warrant that has been signed by a judge that is... Uh, uh, that let me just switch that. Yes. Test, test. Yeah, test. Okay. Uh, that, a warrant must be signed by a judge that is specific to the information that, uh, or the items that are to be searched or seized from an individual. And in my particular case, uh, those procedures were not followed through. Uh, my property was in my vehicle, and I was not in my vehicle, uh, but I was arrested, the keys were taken out of my pocket, uh, walked outside of the building that I was in, to my car, and my car was opened up, and they had searched my car. Uh, granted, it is it was an illegal act that I was uh, doing, but it was out of uh, civil disobedience because I believe that individuals that had medical conditions should have the ability to have access to medicine, and I was assisting them in those endeavors. Uh, since that time, I I'm sorry about this. Uh, what luck, you know? <laughs> uh, Your voice is loud enough for me to hear. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, I, yes, and I, I think I'm... Yeah. Okay, maybe this will keep working. Um, all right, so... Uh, so this, this whole 
case uh, was thrown out of court because the procedures of the Fourth Amendment were not, uh, they, they did not follow them correctly. And so since this point in time, I decided to myself that I would like to get involved with government uh, instead of doing civil disobedience, I would rather go through the proper channels to try to amend the law so that this sort of behavior by other individuals in the future would no longer be uh, subject to arrest. So that really opened up an entire new world to me. I had not gotten involved in electoral politics or in uh, engaging with my state legislature before. I didn't uh, follow how state agencies operated, but I went through a number of different procedures in order to try to amend the law. I learned how to do uh, what's called in my state data requests, which is to go to state agencies and ask them for data on how they operate. I went to different drug task forces in the state and in the fourth one? Uh, I don't know. No? no. Okay, I'm just going to speak loud. Yeah. Um, I could perhaps juggle uh, these as I speak. <laughs> and, um, for some time. Uh, but, um, it's the batteries. Yeah, but the uh, batteries. No, no, yeah, they I think are, all four. They're, they're, yeah, um, but okay, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just speak though. loudly so with I, my diaphragm. Um, okay. So I. Uh, like I said, this was an entirely new world for me that I was trying to engage in. And I realized over the course of a, a number of years, probably about five years, that it was a very hard endeavor that I had sought to, to go forward with. And the unfortunate result of all of this was I realized that it is very, very difficult to engage with a political system such as my, the one that I was within, which is the state of Minnesota and the state of Iowa. And I also came to another conclusion that it is, uh, well, I, I should back up very shortly here. Uh, so fast forward from the arrest date of about five years, uh, there was a gentleman on a news, uh, a, a newscast called Democracy Now. This gentleman's name was Bill Binney, uh, William Binney. He had been working with the U.S. National uh, Security Agency, the NSA, for 40 years. And he, in 2012, uh, came out with uh, a revelation to the world and said that the National Security Agency had, after 9-11, decided to turn the uh, surveillance machine that he himself had helped orchestrate and build, he had turned that machine in on inside to the United States itself. And so all of the individuals in the US after 9-11 uh, were also being surveilled in the same way that everyone else in the world had been surveilled. So uh, I say this uh, not because uh, well, I say this to emphasize the fact that equality is not always great because if you are all equally surveilled or equally uh, oppressed, this is not a great situation for equality. And I realized very quickly that certain fundamental principles should be upheld and uh, respected. Uh, among these, um, as the U.S. Declaration of Independence says, are the rights to liberty, uh, the right to pursue happiness, and the right to life. And uh, frankly, I believed that my own government had not been uh, respecting the rights of world citizens for a very long time, that they had been violating the U.N. Declaration of universal rights for an extremely long time, and that now uh, myself, who perhaps previously had some sort of privilege as an American citizen, uh, also had been uh, removed of those very fundamental rights. And so the focus that I had uh, to try to change the drug laws in my state had, had then taken a new 
uh, perspective. I realized even if every single individual in the state of Minnesota had the right to possess and use and to give to uh, sick individuals that are perhaps on their deathbed or have a chronic illness, the right to have a medicine, which uh, I believe that cannabis is a medicine for these people, uh, I thought to myself, if everyone could have this, but uh, everyone also is being surveilled in where they go, uh, what they do on the internet, uh, who they speak to, uh, who they talk to on their telephone, that the result is not going to be a great one. Uh, perhaps we have liberty in one area, but a very more basic liberty has been eroded. Uh, at that point in time, I decided perhaps I should try, because I was not getting very far with my elected representatives, perhaps I uh, should try to run for office myself. And so I decided to sign up to run for the State House of Representatives in Minnesota. And the campaign promises that I made were that I would have a warrantless surveillance free zone where within uh, the place that I resided that we would not conduct any sort of uh, warrantless surveillance upon people. Uh, the sad thing is that the Fourth Amendment, uh, which I had said previously, uh, it, it requires people, uh, it requires the government to have a very specific warrant. This warrant is specific to which specific individual or individuals it is to be targeting and what sort of content it is to be grabbing. And in the case of bulk surveillance, which I believe because of uh, Snowden, who came out one year after uh, Bill Binney, uh, we all as world citizens know that this is not being abided by. And unfortunately, the US government doesn't interpret the Fourth Amendment to extend to citizens that are not US citizens. Uh, but I decided I should make this my campaign promise to individuals. Uh, unfortunately, this campaign of mine did not go very well. I was heads up against uh, one other candidate uh, to try to get into the state house, and I got 10% of the vote, and the other candidate got 90%. So not that great. Uh, and I decided to myself that perhaps I should be thinking a bit more fundamental, that I shouldn't be trying to save uh, 4.2 million people that live in my state and protect all of them with a law, but instead I should try to focus on the concept of having one individual be able to talk to another individual using encryption, which uh, prevents uh, I, th it is very true that there should be a dual track, that we should try to focus on both. But I thought to myself, I, as an individual, cannot even speak to someone else, a family member, a friend, uh, perhaps even to a lawyer if I had one, uh, to a medical professional, and be able to talk to them in confidence. And so, because of this new realization, I decided to get uh, Educated, So I did a lot of research into seeing what the state of co communication was in the world. And what I discovered was extremely terrifying. Uh, <laughs> if you have a, a cell phone uh, and you want to talk to another cell phone, um, much of the time you must use the cellular network. And this is a, a network that is riddled with holes and is very insecure. Uh, I discovered that if you are using a proprietary operating system on a desktop or a laptop, like Windows or uh, um, Apple, that these sort of operating systems have built within them uh, backdoors that can spy on you. And I also discovered that the US government had been, through the PRISM program, going to the biggest tech, uh, hardware, and software companies in the world, these humongous mega corporations, which perhaps are the biggest companies that the world has ever even seen, and telling them that if you want to continue to operate, you must provide us 
the government with direct connections to your databases so that they can see everything that they want to. And this was a, a terrifying real, realization. And I decided to get involved with the scrappy underdog uh, organizations that are trying to liberate technology from these mega corporations that had now become intertwined in an insanely complicated connection uh, with a power that has been revealed to be not following the rule of law, uh, not only the Constitution of the United States, but also international law has had been abridged and is continuing to be uh, not followed by these organizations. So, uh, I realized very quickly, as far as cell phone technology goes, that a, uh, an operating system called Replicant uh, existed, that there were efforts being made to take the Android operating system that had been made by Google, and uh, the, the plan was to take all of the proprietary uh, bits of this operating system out so that we were left with a free software uh, operating system, 100%. And uh, it was a very difficult endeavor to source uh, a device that I could put Replicant onto. However, after a period of time, I and, and also after having gone to Libre Planet, which is a conference that's put on annually by the Free Software Foundation, uh, I realized that there are other individuals out there that, that existed in uh, away from keyboard, AFK, uh, that had already taken uh, a part of this liberation process, and that they were utilizing this software on these uh, particular hardware devices to be able to communicate with one another. Uh, I then realized that this is not the, the end, that even if you are utilizing an operating system that is completely free, you still are needing to utilize the, the methods of connecting to other devices. This includes uh, lines that cross uh, under the ocean from one continent to another. This includes communication that goes up to satellites that are orbiting the Earth and back down. And this also includes cellular towers that are located uh, in order to tr create coverage for these networks. And with all of these methods, you, the NSA, as revealed by Snowden, is trying to collect data that is trans uh, that is passing through these different network connections. And so in order to combat this scenario, I realized that the process of encrypting and decrypting the communication between the endpoints was of critical importance. And so I got to enter a brand new world of trying to learn how to communicate with other individuals using encrypted technologies. Uh, these included things like OTR, uh, uh, off-the-record messaging. Um, more recently, this also included uh, a protocol called OMEMO, which is used for XMPP conversations. Uh, also, this includes PGP, uh, pretty good privacy, that allows you to encrypt your email communications with individuals. And what I discovered is it is a very difficult process to myself encrypt and decrypt and keep keys uh, that are used to do this process uh, to keep them private. And it is also equally hard to communicate with other people because it does not do me very good if I can encrypt uh, a communication and then have no one to send it to. And so I discovered that I must find a way to educate other people in my personal sphere of influence and also try to create bonds with people that are trying to do this sort of work and to learn together. And so out of this, I decided to start a 
local chapter of what is a, a national movement of crypto parties, which are very, uh, in, uh, they're very relaxed environments that one can go to. Perhaps uh, we had them at a bar where we would order pizza and a pitcher of beer and sit around and try to take our devices and make communications happen that are encrypted within, uh, with one another. And this was a, a very liberating experience for me because at, for the first time, I was able to take a free software operating system and I was able to communicate in a way that was much more secure than I ever had, uh, had access to before to communicate with other people that were running free software operating systems uh, with encryption as well. But that was not the end, I discovered quickly. Uh, these free op operating systems still had non-free bootloaders or initialization software or BIOSes. And so I was then introduced to a, a brand new world of trying to work with the Replicate community and also with another community called uh, LibreBoot, which is a BIOS replacement for uh, computers for their initialization software, uh, to be able to have a 100%, to, to have hardware that can run 100% free software from the initialization all the way through to the operating system to the communication platforms that are on top of it. And at this point in time, I thought that I had succeeded, that I had gotten to a place that uh, I could have some sort of a feeling that I had this security to communicate with others. But I, I then had another uh, frustration and, and revelation that even in this environment, that it is very difficult for individuals to be able to obtain the hardware and to flash or to convert their hardware to be able to have this on their machines at all. And so from this uh, revelation, I decided to then partner with, uh, about six months ago, with an organization, uh, Technoethical, in order to help individuals obtain the hardware that they can use uh, out of the box that has this freedom baked in. And we still are uh, working with the Replicant Project to be able to offer this uh, option to individuals, uh, but we still are about one step away. Uh, we are no, we're not currently able to have devices that run Replicant uh, that have a free bootloader. And so this perhaps, with the GTA 04, uh, which is made in Munich, Germany, perhaps a device that we can port to and have 100% freedom on cell phones. Uh, still, at this point in time though, we would not be able to, to use the cellular network, which is used by most cell phones, because that will still not be uh, a free operating or a, a free network that we can go on. However, uh, with the work of uh, Phil and other individuals, uh, also with Technoethical, uh, we are able to use these devices with a uh, external Wi-Fi adapter. So we are able to use the devices uh, without the cellular network and communicate with one another. Um, so, this all is a uh, personal narrative as to how I got into this wonderful world of free software, which uh, comes with it many frustrations still, uh, but also it is an extremely fulfilling place that the, work, the hard work that you do in a community can yield results that can uh, influence thousands of people. And it's uh, a very different type of work that than I had experienced trying to lobby a legislature. Because if you lobby to try to change a law for six years, 
and you don't get anything passed, then you are, you really have helped no one at all. <laughs> However, if you are trying to liberate hardware devices and you can get that into the hands of thousands of people, then you've helped thousands of people experience what it is like to have freedom in a tangible way. And so, at least for myself, this has become something that I want to keep putting my energy into and to keep uh, seeking uh, to get these devices into more and more people's hands because it is an extremely wonderful feeling and I believe that it is a feeling that can't be expressed in words. But the feeling of utilizing technology that you know does not have backdoors, that does not have proprietary software running on it, using this type of technology uh, makes me full of joy. And I, it makes me also full of joy to be able to help other people uh, get access to this as well. Um, I did not mention this prior, but I actually have no ability at all to read or to write any sort of code at all. So all of this work has been done by myself uh, simply as a user and as someone that has trying to been that has been trying to help collaborate and organize groups of people that are from wide ranges of places that come from wide ranges of backgrounds to get together, put our heads together, and try to make something out of what we have already been given. And I think that's the definition of freedom, is taking what you have been given and having the ability to create from it. Uh, I've been doing a bit of research recently about the concept of freedom itself. And there is a vein in philosophy and in psychiatry that says that freedom is something that human beings really are averse to. It, it sounds antithetical, but uh, we have found throughout history that there have been wide ranges of different movements uh, where people just give away their autonomy they give away their sovereignty to others because freedom for them is very scary. It is something that is hard to grasp. And I will say myself uh, that I have sensed these sort of feelings as well, that it is a, a messy place to be if we're all free and trying to collaborate together within freedom. Uh, Within a free market, for instance, we must decide how to use our own money in order to, in essence, vote with our money as to who should be gaining uh, more resources in exchange for products or services. Uh, in the state of free software, many times we have to deal with uh, working with people that we don't really understand that well. And we must take efforts to humble ourselves and to try to understand how they communicate, how they understand the world, uh, what sort of economic or social or political backgrounds they're coming from. And this has been, for myself, quite a challenge. Uh, also, I, with Technoethical, have been making the attempt to have my own business that is federated with other individuals that have their own business. And I have found, after having an entire lifetime of just getting a paycheck instead of having a personal business, that this is something that is not easy, that it, it takes a lot of work, that it takes a lot of mental strain and uh, a lot of anguish at times in order to try to muster up the courage to uh, embrace freedom because it's uh, a scary situation, as I had mentioned before. Uh, but throughout it all, uh, through all of the, the times that I've had revelations that in essence have felt like my entire world is being ripped apart and that new ways of categorizing how things are uh, 
throughout this whole process, I have found that after the breaking, that there perhaps isn't a moment of complete fulfillment afterwards. But I believe that I am orientating myself to a world that is more objective. That perhaps the feeling of security that I had prior to all of these experiences were illusions. That there never was a point in time where I was safe, that I was comfort, in, in comfort, or that I was secure. That instead, I was mistaken, and that the, the reality that I'm now uh, seeing, that things are complicated, that they're complex, that I shouldn't have faith in much of anything, that I should doubt, uh, that these are, in some odd way, a place that comfort can be derived, because it is what how the world really is. And so I, I just simply want to say that I encourage all of you here and anyone watching the video uh, to embrace this place of confusion and to go further in, to realize that self-doubt will occur, that you should doubt your technology, that you should always be questioning how you can make things better, but also have no illusions that you will come to a place where you are finally free, that you have nothing else to do, and realize that the hard work that happens to try to liberate oneself, to liberate your friends, your family, from any circumstance, whether it be technological, social, economic, it's going to be a tough one, and it probably will never end. However, within this complexity, we can find some sort of peace, because we are seeing the world as it really is, a complete mess. <laughs> and uh, with that, uh, I would like to take any questions that people might have, or comments, uh, or concerns. Um, Thank you. I, I have a comment. Yes. So you said you got 10% in that election. Yes. I think that's more than great. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate so that. 10% is huge. In my opinion, it's huge for, for someone who, who just uh, uh, goes in there and has no connections and no uh, previous uh, experience with politics, 10% is huge. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> What do you think about uh, techno, uh, about proper engineering uh, Talos 2? Uh, I, I must say that I have not done a lot of research into the Talos 2. Uh, it sounds like we really need to be contemplating different architectures for our technology. And I believe it's Power 8 that is being used for nine, the Talos 2? Power 9. Tal uh, power 9. Uh, it seems like the x86, the AMD, and a lot of the ARM uh, architectures have within them uh, a lot of problems. There's some devices that have these architectures that can be used with freedom, but we need to be thinking, what is next? Uh, especially if we can't convince any of these organizations that are making these architectures to change them, uh, we need to be looking at at other things, and I think it is great that people are, like the Talos to trying to give to the public an out-of-the-box solution uh, that is different than these other architectures. Uh, and I do want to say, too, that I very much respect the Free Software Foundation, and they have many times said to their members, uh, we really want you to pre-order the Talos 2. And because of that recommendation, um, I, I believe that it, it sounds like a great idea, but I don't want to give it a complete recommendation because I just personally have not done the extensive research needed to, to say that I support it completely. So uh, you've done a lot of uh, activist work in the US. Yes. Have you found uh, more success in uh, the EU, for example? Or um, I, I have not spent much time in the EU. This is only my third time visiting Europe at all. And uh, the first time, I was not very involved with politics. 
uh, it was about six years ago. And so uh, attending FOSDEM in February was my second visit, and I was only here for about five days. And like I said, I've only been here for about uh, two days uh, this, this time. But I'll, I'll be here for a month, uh, living and working with Technoethical and trying to collaborate in this messy process that I was talking about. And uh, so I, I would love to get more educated and more involved with politics here, but as a, a non-citizen, I don't know how much lobbying can be done on the, the local, state, or European Union level. Uh, but I, I very much want to be educating myself more. And I do see that uh, places like Germany, for instance, they're having investigations into the corporations that are allowing this surveillance to happen, and or not just allowing, perhaps, but uh, deciding to have this surveillance happen. And they even brought Bill Binney, who I very much respect, to Germany uh, to speak in front of the, the investigation that was going on. Uh, at least that's my understanding. And so it boggles my mind that someone like Bill Binney um, in the U.S. is someone that had his house raided, uh, and while he was in the shower, someone came in with a, a gun and pointed it at him while he was naked, and and searched his whole home, and he was charged with crimes for having tried to uh, work within the system to try to get this change happening. And so, it, I see a very stark stark contrast between the two countries where. And the U.S., someone like this is vilified, put on trial, and has their home raided. Whereas in the EU, he is seen as an expert witness into crimes against humanity and has been brought in to testify as to his knowledge as to what's going on. I know, I know with uh, Snowden that uh, the U.S. was very polarized. It was, uh, it had... Uh, uh, the Silicon Valley area where people uh, agreed with Snowden and they uh, considered him a hero. And then you had Washington, which almost unanimously considered him a traitor. Um, I mean, why, why does this happen? Do people uh, think about different things? And those uh, living in Silicon Valley, uh, working for technology, they understand what's going on and why that's important. And Washington people thinking about how to run the seat, the, the country, and how to keep uh, people under control. What do you think is that? Well, I think that it is a a, a way of understanding, uh, perhaps, the Fourth Amendment. It it perhaps is a way uh, of or two different perspectives as to what that amendment means. So the. The amendment says that individuals should be secure in their persons, and their papers and effects should not be seized or searched without a warrant that is particular to the, the instance. So the key word that I get out of this is that people are secure in their persons. And so security, based on my reading of the Fourth Amendment, comes from Having, by having the government prevented from looking into what you're doing, uh, unless they have an extremely good reason and have a third party uh, from a different branch of government, a judge, deciding that yes, we also agree that this should be searched. Um, in the other way of, of looking at it, security is not derived from people's uh, persons and effects and papers being um, secured, that, that uh, instead we must have bulk surveillance, that we must look at everyone's data, at their communications, and by doing that, we can find security. And so I think that uh, it is important to point out that the PRISM program that Snowden revealed included almost all of the Silicon Valley companies. And perhaps they were pressured, perhaps, into being a part of that program, but that program gave bulk access to the National Security Agency of user data. 
And so perhaps some of it is a marketing ploy to say, yes, our company is pro Snowden, and we're happy that now people know that we were forced to give our data to the NSA because we couldn't stick up for ourselves and for our users. Uh, but yes, uh, Washington DC sees him as a, a traitor, as a, and, and really he's being charged as a spy uh, under the Espionage Act. And so I, I think that there is a division even within just the general population of the US as well. But it seems like support for what Edward Snowden did and the knowledge that he provided, uh, support is perhaps going up a little bit as people are learning more and more uh, about how pervasive this problem really is. Um, but it's hard for me to speak too much to the anti-Snowden mentality because I have a hard time grasping why that is happening. <laughs> it's just, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any more? Yes, yes. Uh, I have a comment. Um, unfortunately, uh, there won't be any new GTA 04, mm. but uh, there are, for instance, other phones like the uh, LG uh, Optimus Black, which need a lot of work but can be found second hand. And so there are other alternatives and maybe other new phones that will come, uh, such as the new 900 or maybe the Perism phone. And so, yeah. yeah, so uh, just to repeat for uh, any of the videos that are going on, uh, the GTA 04, which I mentioned as a possible port for Replicant 6, uh, might not be the only device and, and likely won't be the only device that we can port to to have 100% freedom in cellular technology. Uh, there are things like the Neo 900, uh, the Optimus Black, and a couple other uh, options that, oh, that perhaps we have not even found yet that, that might be coming out. So the, the hard work goes on, and I really encourage all of you to uh, get involved with one of these software projects that I had mentioned. Uh, specifically, I think that Libreboot, Triscoll, uh, Parabola, and Replicant are amazing communities that if you want to really stretch yourself and, uh, and also help yourself realize the state of technology, getting involved with these organizations and trying to assist uh, in a very egalitarian, cooperative, mutual aid sort of way, uh, it'd be great to get involved with them. Um, any other questions or comments? Do you want to learn programming? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, I, I very much would like to. My uh, process in my head is that I would love to first learn compiling and to learn how to compile things from source in a very comprehensive way so that I can compile my own operating systems from source uh, and, and software on top of that. Uh, so that's my, my next project. And there then a, course, after that, I think I'd like to learn some, uh, learn how to program. There is a course from Nantes to Tetris where you start from uh, just logical gate and end up by uh, programming your toy uh, operating system and uh, making Tetris on top of it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, I am just continually Finding new horizons, it, it seems, is the theme of my life. <laughs> and I think that programming is another horizon that I will be getting to as, uh, as I learn a couple, or as I get to the, the horizon I currently see. So once I get there, I'm sure programming will likely be the next step. Uh, another comment on the French Constitution, they use the word sûreté to refer to the same concept that is protecting people against the, from the state. Yes. Uh, and does that mean security? No, it's uh, uh, an ancient meaning. It's not the same meaning as now. Uh, at the time, it means to protect people from the state, from the state abuses and so on. Yeah, and it seems, uh, perhaps in France as in the US, 
the concept of protecting the people from the state has been flipped upside down, where yeah. the state is protecting the people, and by doing so, they must get rid of their rights <laughs> in order to, for security purposes. Or, or their reserve protecting them from the people. <laughs> <laughs> sure. The, Protect the state from the people. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's nothing to laugh about it. Just, that's exactly how, how it works nowadays. Yes, people well, are, are convinced that the state will protect them by taking away rights from them. Yes. Yeah. Well, pretty much the majority, of, or at least that's what I experienced in Italy. Pretty much the majority of people think that it is uh, the right thing to do to give away rights in order to be protected by some other entity. So, and um, that's very scary to me. It's not something. Well, yeah, we can <laughs> laugh about it, but if you if you deeply think about it, it's. It's, it is not something to laugh about. It is, it is very, very scary. Well, uh, I think there's a saying, I laugh about it because if I didn't laugh about it, I'd be crying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but there is both things going on. Like there is uh, the state that, part of the state that wants to protect itself from the people, and there is also, uh, at least in French, much more interaction between the people and the state to try to change things. There are organizations like La Quadrature du Net, which uh, gives tools to people to like call their representative and speak with them, interact with the system and uh, things like that. So for instance, on behalf of Replicant, I, I was uh, invited to the Telecom Authority, uh, Telecom Regulation Authority to speak to explain what was uh, limiting us so they might help us or things great. like this. That's great. Yes. So th there's also some interaction going on. So it's not that bad. You have the two sides at once. But, yeah. yeah, as I said, uh, I think there really ought to be a dual track. Um, perhaps I just got a little bit burnt out from the track of trying to influence government. And, and also, while doing so, I didn't focus enough on my own personal ability to have freedom in my technology. And so I've been uh, maybe focusing a bit more on this at, for a time, uh, but I think equalizing it out would be a good no, thing. That's because you live in the US, it's much harder to influence things if you don't have a lot of money. <laughs> very, very true, yes. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, thank you so much for attending and for listening. And uh, I will be around all day today. And uh, specifically, I'll be doing a workshop outside on how to put Replicant on your device. And perhaps we can help you try to source the device as well in order to put it on if you don't have one currently. But uh, I really appreciate you all being here and uh, letting me share my story. So thank you so much. Thank you. So I have a quick inquiry. Uh, we would like to order some pizza for lunch. And uh, is everyone can have pizza. Uh, it'll be donation based if you'd like to help pay for it. Uh, but we want to know what sort of proportions as far as vegetarian versus meat pizza we're going to be ordering. And so if you could raise your hand if you would prefer meat Pizza. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what if I like both uh, vegetables and meat? Uh, you have two hands. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, meat pizza, it looks okay. And then uh, vegetarian pizza. Uh, okay, so I, I think that might be a 50-50. So, uh, we'll go with that. And... Um, Sorry? 
I don't know. It's probably some internal bias. And, uh, I'm talking to my therapist. It's about it. Yeah. Um, also, I uh, for the next talk, I let's record yes. this part. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, Just a question: Do you accept bitcoins? I uh, believe so. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Bitcoin is accepted for pizza, which is very apropos because there's a Bitcoin Pizza Day. If you're not familiar, there was an individual that spent thousands of Bitcoin to buy two pizzas, and at this point, I think it's it would those two pizzas are worth about seven million dollars uh, had he kept the Bitcoin the whole time. All right. We have the Bitcoin address uh, on the website. Yes. If you go to donate, uh, you have the Bitcoin address there. Yes. Uh, okay, so as I had been talking about, uh, I got involved with the, the replicant community and uh, <laughs> um, I, okay, so as I had been speaking about during my talk, uh, I was very pleasantly surprised when I came across uh, the replicant project and community and uh, the individual that started off this whole wonderful project is actually here today. Uh, Gnutu, uh, also known as Dennis, yes. uh, is here and he will be giving a, our next talk. And so I would love it if you could give him a very warm welcome. Uh, <laughs> and stick around, I am very excited and I will be watching the entire thing. So. <laughs> I just have to do the computer. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, sounds great. Mm -hmm. uh, feel free to go to the table and say yes, uh, I prefer typing the password and all that. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but it's better there because no one will see you. Yes, but when I if you do that, I don't connect it. Uh, Who's uh, smartphone? <laughs> oh. Did, uh, someone left his smartphone. I can ask out in the hall. Yes, I have to choose that. There's a second time, the camera falls. There was also another phone there. Can you tell us what? Yeah. Is it okay? Oh, seems like. It seems to be like a rough, um, pretty rock phone. So.
objects on the displays. So this is here. So I guess I must uh, shout or something like that. Uh, 
uh, or for instance, capture the keystroke, uh, things like that. So um, there's also a lot of confusion in, in what free software means. A uh, lot of people uh, confuse that with gratis, but I guess here not much people do. But uh, yet, uh, when it comes to security, uh, there's also a lot of confusion between freedom and security. Uh, for instance, if we take Apple devices, they are secure, but also secure against their owners. Uh, that is, if you have, a, for instance, an iPhone, that you can change what's inside and so on, and it might, and it, it does uh, violate your privacy, but so it's not exactly the same thing because many people make confusion uh, with that. Uh, so uh, now with this background on, we will look at how a computer starts. So if you take a 100% free software distribution and you install it on any common computers, laptop or whatever, you still have a lot of freedom issues. Uh, so, yeah, we look at uh, old computer first because it's um, more simple. So, if you take a computer like a laptop or a PC uh, or a desktop computer, you remove the hard drive, you press the power button, you, you will see some screen like that. Uh, so, here, this is clearly some software is running. So, we will look at what that software is, what it does, and why it's there. So that's, that has many names before it was called BIOS, then it's now called UEFI. There's also some other variations such as EFI, but it's practically it does the same thing. It's, uh, yeah, it's initialized the hardware and not the operating system. So yes, it's located. This is a yeah. So this is a X200. So if I disassemble the computer, like uh, on the main board, if I remove the pan rest, uh, under it is a flash chip. So this is where the uh, boot program is located. So that's the BIOS, EFI, UFI, and so on. Uh, so here, a closer look. So how does it work? Um, um, when the power is applied to the computer, um, the flash chips is mapped in memory. It's like RAM. It's at a fixed address, FFF000, and the processor will execute code that's at that address. So that's why it works without a uh, hard disk and so on. So, um, obviously, um, no, no. When the computer is started, like when the power button is pressed, the hard disk doesn't work, the display doesn't work, there is no RAM working and so on. So that's why um, the boot software is needed. Um, so operating system typically also requires RAM to be initialized, uh, like the Linux kernel doesn't work without RAM. So something else still needs to initialize the RAM and the hardware. And uh, people also often have like a drop menu to select which kernel to run when using the Linux, so people expect the display to work, also drop feedback and so on. So, Yes, as I said, it initializes the RAM and uh, it also then loads the operating system and also passes some information to the operating system to tell what hardware it's running on. And the issue is that uh, not only it loads the operating system so it could modify it, uh, but it also continues to run in the background while the operating system is started. So then there's two ways it continues to run. There's ACPI. It passes some code to the operating system, which the operating system runs. It's an virtual machine, but still, yes, uh, it's not great uh, if the code is proprietary, for instance. And 
SMM is uh, privilege mode even higher than the one the Linux kernel is running on. And so, and for instance, uh, on certain uh, computers with AMD processor, when you power up the computer, it will uh, rewrite the flash chip, like you run power up in GNU Linux, and uh, the flash chip will be rewritten. So what happened behind the scene is that when the BIOS or when the boot software um, set up the initialize the hardware and so on, it will put some code in memory and that code will be triggered on certain events like uh, for instance the computer pour it off, pouring off or uh, somebody trying to write the flat chips and things like that. So this code, the, uh, this uh, capability is more powerful than the one the Linux kernel runs on. It's called the privilege levels in uh, x86. So, uh, obviously, uh, like no Linux or something like this, you have exactly the same freedom issue like uh, uh, privacy, uh, be able to control the software, and so on, and, and so on. So here, unfortunately, it's mostly invisible to users, so they tend to care less about but you still have all the uh, issue you've got with proprietary software, even if it looks invisible. So, for instance, um, in the boot software is able to modify the operating system that executes, and in fact, in some cases, it does. Uh, it could refuse to run the software you wish. In some cases, it also does. Um, so, the, the, the first case is uh, there's a um, software called Computrust. Uh, Computrust, which is uh, marketed as anti theft so that's uh, that's in the into the BIOS. For instance, in the since in all x60s with the default boot software, you get that. And what it does, it will modify some files inside Windows to install a rootkit. So it really modifies files on the hard disk. So um, we don't know if it still does something when running GNU Linux, but it's still very scary. And then it gives control of your computer to attacker which found flaws or to the company I guess which uh, which made the computer trust. So um, it would refuse the, to run the software you wish. For instance on uh, ARM um, laptops running Windows you cannot run GNU Linux. They, they, they try to prevent you from doing it. So if people find security flow, they might be able to boot GNU Linux, but it's not intended. Um, it could also refuse to start when you change the Wi-Fi card. For instance, you want to use Trisker, and so you replace the Wi-Fi card with an internal one that's compatible with Trisker, and your computer will refuse to boot. Uh, also, there, is, uh, there are security issues also present in good firmware, uh, in um, good software. Um, for instance, um, uh, there is a security issue called the uh, WoW Hammer, where a program can change the adjacent uh, bits in the, the can change bits in the adjacent memory, like the program run in RAMs, and it can change bit outside of his uh, of the RAM region it runs in. So you have things like that. Uh, you have also more hardware security things, like where the operating system can take the control of the full computer, like where the BIOS runs or things like that. So. Uh, also, uh, be able to control your own computing is very important, like to change how it boots and things like this. So, um, yeah, I already explained computer trace. So, so um, like being able to modify what it does, for instance, practically, um, you can do stuff with, you can modify it to like boot GNU Linux from. Um, the inter put a GNU Linux installer from the internet over the Wi-Fi uh, with CBIOS and PC, but we will see that later. 
to have a fully encrypted hard disk with uh, nothing clear on it, like to upgrade your good software and to upgrade it and uh, change it to UEFI or to add support for hardware features such as the IOMMU, in, for instance, to export PCI card in between machines or things like that. Since it, it is dependent on the good software, if you can change it, uh, you can't add these things. So boot on SD card, you, you, you could also do that for instance, and support for that. So the most important part is if it's not free software, you can't really trust the machine anymore. So it really has to. And uh, you also need it to really control your computing. It's not only a matter of security, but also personal control about your computing. So, um, to summarize, uh, the boot software is the first software that runs on the computer, on the main processor, and it loads the operating system. So, part of it is still running after that, and you have a lot of uh, security issues and privacy issues if it's not free software, because it has more control than the operating system itself. Uh, for instance, I explained what happened on PowerOff, but for instance, if you want to uh, update um, uh, the, the, the BIOS, since it's on a flash chip, you have to write a flash chip and it can be done uh, in command line from the computer. But if it's set, uh, for instance, if it's set uh, read only and like uh, the program you're using try to set the flash chip read write, uh, the code that's in, put in memory by the BIOS um, could be executed and put the chip back in um, in read only mode. Um, so it, the, it, the BIOS can set up that at boot. So it can be it can make it impossible to rewrite uh, the flash chip, for instance, uh, from the computer because uh, you can power up the computer and uh, reinstall it the way. So um, that's, that was for all computers, but nowadays it gets way worse because there's another processor called the management engine that's present on most uh, Intel computers from uh, 2006 since today. So um, on this uh, processor, there's a code that runs and there's an operating system and so on alongside the, the one you run like Linux and so on so it's a separate system and some of the computers uh, Intel computers uh, for business uh, have a feature called AMT so that's the software that runs on this processor which allows the system administrator to remotely uh, administrate your computer so the system administrator can see what you see on your screen and act, interact like if that person was in front of your computer. So it's kind of scary and that works because the uh, that processor has too much capabilities and also access to the network. So we'll see that in more details. So uh, business computers are used a lot by free software developers because they have screens uh, that are uh, that are not problematic for for the health because screens which are glossy, which reflects, uh, then tend to strain the eye to to make the eye you know, to produce eye strain. So. Um, so it's nice uh, for a system administrator, but it's not free software and user might not be aware that it exists. So it's quite problematic. Um, so MT is just uh, an application running as, on this processor. So since this processor runs an, an operating system, it's also run other application. Uh, for instance, uh, digital restriction management. They have something called PAVP, where um, and the like a video is encrypted and sent to the computer over a network, and then you know, Linux doesn't see the video decrypted because the management engine will do the decryption and will then uh, display it on the display. So it, it's quite uh, scary and powerful. 
they also market it for a security application, like to take out the control of the computer from the user and have things that execute uh, in a so-called secure way outside of the user control. So, uh, it's also used for remote management with the IMT software and things like that. So, in the case. So, um, uh, the flash chip we saw earlier, uh, on recent hardware it has several partitions, so there is one for the BIOS CFI. And there is one also for the management engine where there is the, its code that's loaded from there and the, the code is signed and proprietary software and is required on recent device to start the computer. So, <laughs> it's really a problem. Um, and, uh, yeah. um, so, the management engine processor has been moving so first was in the network card and in the chipset and now it, it's in, in, in the same um, package than processor like it's if you have a processor like that it's it's on the same chip but it's two separate systems so um, so as I said that code is signed and not free software so um, and user are not um, supposed to interact with it. So, so um, the thing is that um, that chip also has control over the Intel Wi-Fi and the integrated Intel um, Ethernet card, and that's how it can uh, allow to remote manage the computer. So you set up the network through, for instance, a BIOS program and. Uh, that talks to this chip and it's totally independent from the OS you're running, like new Linux, uh, and yet it can see what's on the screen and so on. So it, it doesn't need cooperation from the device. Is it like IP KVM? Uh, something like that. It has the, the same features, but that's an application called IMT which uses that kind of features, but it, it does the same, yes. So can we try it, I mean, to manage computers in this application? Yes. Is it uh, freely available? Uh, yes, uh, so the question was if it was like an IP KVM and if we can manage computer with it. Uh, the yeah. IMT application does exactly that, yes. Uh -huh. But it's not free software. It runs on your hardware, it has access to your RAM, um, you know, and what's on the display, on the network card, and controls really the system and it's not free software so uh, I would not advise to use it and we will see it after a uh, while. You, uh, you have exactly the same issue as proprietary software so, um, so while AMT doesn't uh, give access to your RAM uh, the, the ship really has access to all the system RAM so if there is a security vulnerability or malicious code inside since it's proprietary we cannot know it might be able to like extract your uh, decryption key or whatever so. and, and there was a, a rootkit uh, done by a security researcher to do exactly that for all version of the management engine to extract uh, things from RAM so, there is some security flaws in uh, uh, software running on a management engine. For instance, specifically, uh, that is specifically for MT. So, remote provisioning on a computer like the X200, you can, uh, if MT is not set up, an attacker can set it up remotely uh, if, it, if the attacker is on the same network. So, what you do is you buy a certificate and then it will auto-configure. You buy a certificate, download software for Intel and acts like a DHCP server and it will auto-configure it on your server if you do attacker. So that's really problematic. Uh, fortunately at that time uh, IMT didn't have that many features but yet. But more recently there is a security issue when MT is enabled on computers between 2000, made between 2008 and 2017 that allow an attacker to access 
uh, empty with a zero length password. So no security. So both are documented on the Wikipedia page for Intel MT. It's on the security issue section. Uh, I will show the link again. Uh, so the, the issue is uh, that's typically um, the, the code that shown here. It's um, it's on the same chip than the BIOS. So it's up to the vendor to give you a BIOS update. And if there is none, you still have the security flow and you can fix it unless you uh, you mess with the flash chip yourself. So that's also possible, but not a lot of people are technically able to do that. So that's a lot of computers. And it affects uh, like business computers only, which have IMT, uh, not all compute, not all Intel computers, but still yes. Uh, so that's what I was telling. So on uh, typically on um, like consumer computers, there is not not the IMT features like um, on on the management engine partition. The application is not present. Uh, How to check it? Is there a command to check if I have MT? Um, maybe, yes, uh, maybe in core boot sources. I don't know if it can check for MT, but there is Intel ME tool, Intel ME tool or something like this. There's a tool to check in what state is the management engine. But typically, if you have MT, um, when you boot, when the BIOS boot or the UEFI boot, um, you have a way to uh, enter um, configuration for IMT. So you have to check in the BIOS settings or UEFI settings how to enable uh, like messages and so on. And then you have uh, a message that says press CTRP to configure a management engine or something like that. You press the button and then you have all the configuration to do that. So, uh, I have also a link at the end which uh, a reference which shows uh, that someone used it for administrating computers. And it's really, really, really a bad idea because the, the feature is not free software, full of security bugs, and so on. So, yeah. So, AMD. Um, so, modern AMD have similar issues, um, but uh, not a lot of people are looking into it and documenting it. Uh, most of the research happens on Intel um, uh, platforms, probably because there are more computers made with Intel platforms. So the, the other issue is that uh, the Intel GPU, at least on the X200 and uh, LibreBoot supported laptops, works with free software, uh, like in the boot, in, uh, in the operating system and so on. So it's better to have an Intel GPU because 80 GPU and NVIDIA GPU both have freedom problems. Uh, 80, the firmware is non free. And um, while NVIDIA does free, free microcode firmware for other GPUs, but the newer one requires signed firmware so you don't get video acceleration on the last test GPUs. The other issue is that uh, when a computer boots, you take a desktop computer for instance, uh, from 2006 or something like that, you had a more recent video card. The BIOS doesn't know about the video card, but yet something is uh, displayed uh, on the display, but like an image, it, it magically works. Uh, that's because video card have flash chips and the BIOS will run the software that's on the flash chip. So uh, that's when you get a video card and you plug in into a computer, you, are, you have that problem, the, what's on the flash chip is executed by the BIOS or UEFI, and that's non free. Uh, so, AT GPU and NVIDIA GPU rely on that to work, unfortunately. And that's not the case of Intel GPU because that has been replaced in Core Boot and Libre Boot. So, um, Core Boot and Libre Boot. Um, uh, typically, uh, don't handle external GPU, BMC, and embed controller, and things like that. 
but the project has someone related, so like in neighborhood, the ThinkPad has not free embed controller. So the embed controller is a chip that controls the keyboard, so it gets your keystroke, charge the battery, and pour, uh, um, like uh, decide to program the voltage and things like that. So uh, since it has access to the keyboard, that's kind of problematic because it's potentially a keylogger, for instance. Um, BMC is used on server, it's to remote manage, uh, like there's a free software that can do that now, it's maybe called OpenBMC or something like that. So on some device you can remotely manage with OpenMT and with free software. Um, and the external GPU we, we just saw them. So, uh, yeah, uh, the project like Libreboot on some computers, you have free on that controller and not on others, so it's nice to have, but not all computers have free on that controller and free BMC when it's uh, the servers. Uh, so, now that we see the problem, uh, how for a user, uh, how can a user uh, have free software, uh, free boot software? So, um, the easiest way is just to buy a computer from a vendor that ships with Libreboot, such as Technoetical here in Romania, or Viking in Germany, Minifree in the UK, or Libiquity in the USA. Uh, so, the FSF maintains a list of devices that respect user freedom. Uh, so, they, it's a certification and uh, they tell exactly what is required and so you have the list of products and so you can find companies which sell that on this address. Um, so there also is a way like uh, this conference for instance we can install a uh, libre boot. Uh, also hackerspace might have the hardware to do it like flashers and so on. So what you need when you install yourself is hardware to connect to the flash chip so typically you disassemble the laptop and you connect something like that to the flash chip and it's a clip that clips on it so the pins are connected and um, then you connect that that are connected to the pin to a flasher for instance so you often also in conference like FOSDEM and so on you have um, people from core boot or flash ROM that have a boost that are able to flash uh, for instance libre boot or core boot. Uh, so uh, what's uh, also a question that most users have is what's the difference? Like is it visible or um, is it something special about the having libre boot or something like that? Um, so we will see that now. Um, so uh, Libreboot um, relies on a project that's called Coreboot, which uh, is the boot software for a lot of laptops. Unfortunately, Coreboot includes or uh, gets a proprietary uh, software to make more recent device work. So that's not an option for users. So it's better to uh, remove uh, non free code to guarantee freedom. Um, so, Libreboot does that. Um, it also ship compiled uh, code with Coreboot. You expect, even if they're released, you expect it to compile it yourself, which is not easy for everybody. And it also has uh, extensive documentation on how to flash the system and so on. So, so uh, Coreboot. Uh, so that's the upstream project. Uh, it's a free BIOS replacement, as they say, as they tell. Uh, so, Coreboot itself does not very much. It just initializes the hardware and then uh, loads something else, which uh, has to do something. So, uh, for instance, if you want a BIOS compatibility, um, Coreboot will just initialize the hardware and then you add the BIOS compatibility that will act as a normal BIOS and uh, load uh, the bootloader from the hard, load, load the operating system for the hard disk and so on. So it acts like a normal BIOS. 
You also have other options like uh, Tyenocor, which implements UEFI and Club. That's the bootloader used on, most used on GNU Linux, where you select your kernel and so on. So maybe I have, uh, so that 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 that's good. So yeah, and it's, this is a C BIOS. This is a BIOS implementation. You also have it on QMU. So there's not much fancy things, but it boots fast. Uh, so yeah, you press ESP if you want to boot from something else. So um, grab it's the thing you have at the start of the computer. So you need a configuration file, for instance, to to use it, because else you just have a command line. So you can include, for instance, your desktop configuration file, and usually it works. So. Um, in typical setup, Drug is the is installed on the hard disk. So, for instance, uh, in Parabola, it's on the hard disk. So, the boot software like the BIOS loads Drug from the hard disk, which will then select a kernel and boot on it. So, uh, here you can put Drug along with the with Core Boot Liberboot in the flash. So. The, um, you can use it, for instance, to have um, fully encrypted disks. Since you don't need any code on the disk anymore, Grub can open an encrypted disk, can support disk volume management, and so on. You can also uh, put installers, since it supports a configuration file, it supports GPG, signature check, and so on. So it's quite configurable, and for the advanced user, you can play with it and get more secure setup, for instance. Uh, it's also support adding a password to prevent the user from anyone from refreshing your boot software. So you can also uh, have something else like Linux kernel, uh, U-boot, so the chart, which is a bootloader for, from books. So, so you can also have interesting software like uh, memory testing program to see if your run works. Um, NVM, CV, and Core Info are programmed to change BIOS settings, for instance. Uh, so, yes. Uh, and this is Core Info, it gives information on the core boot image you have. So, uh, also, you can boot on networks, because they on network. You can use CBIOS in EPC, and uh, this can use your network card or even Wi-Fi card to boot an installer from the internet, for instance. Uh, you can boot on some PCI card uh, for ATAS, ATAS ports, and so on. So, um, yeah. Uh, here we see that, like the Linux kernel, core boot has logs, so we can retrieve the logs to see what's going on. For instance, if we forgot to put the RAM inside the computer, it will tell us on the logs. So, yeah. And it's, uh, there's also a library to write uh, things like that, so people can, some people get fun having Tetris uh, like in the BIOS. So, and the thing is, if you play with it, there is still some constraints um, on the ThinkPad X60 and uh, computer that ThinkPad of that area, era, uh, sorry, uh, you have only 2 megs of flash, so that's small, uh, so you can fit grub and so on very easily, but Linux kernel, it's, yeah, it's kind of a space constraint. Uh, on uh, more modern ThinkPads like the X200, which are also supported by the group boot, you get usually 8 mega of flash, so uh, open or Libre SMC routers typically have that amount of flash, so you can do a lot of things if you have optimized software. Like, like uh, Linux kernel and TriMFS uh, works with, uh, with that amount of uh, space. So, if you want to try out, you can also compile for QMU and things like that. So, if you want to play with it, I mean. So, uh, the issue is that if you mess with that, uh, you need to be prepared to refresh because um, it might not boot anymore and you cannot 
like replace the hard drive, it, it, it just has no impact on the boot software. So uh, when it doesn't boot, you need to disassemble the laptop, uh, connect the flash programmer as I explained before, and refresh a uh, working image. So um, um, typically how that works is that, um, for instance, there's a computer which runs a uh, software called FlashRun that I connect to a flash programmer that I connect to the flash chip on the uh, computer to be refreshed. So you also need another computer that can run FlashRun. So must be no Linux distribution chip uh, FlashRun. So uh, if you want to install yourself, it yourself it's uh, more complicated. Um, typically, ThinkPad contain protection, preventing the user from refreshing its BIOS, with other thing that the vendor's BIOS updates. So on all the ThinkPads, like the X60, uh, and they didn't protect it entirely, so Core Boot and Libre Boot have a procedure to bypass that flash protection. But on, on, modern, on more modern ThinkPad, the, the community didn't find yet ways to bypass it. So you, when you reflash it, you have to open the laptop and plug a flash program. Uh, you, you cannot just with software reflash it. But when it's installed, um, so this is the, uh, where you plug the flash program. But when it is installed, you can just, uh, for instance, uh, wait a second. Uh, when a uh, Libre Boot is installed or Core Boot, you can access the flash uh, just while running the system, so with flash on. So the, the project which um, yeah, has documentation on which programmer to use and so on is the flash on project. And there's also documentation on the Libre Boot uh, uh, documentation. Uh, also, there's a lot of things to keep in mind when you install your, when you do it yourself. Uh, for instance, to watch out for defective batteries, because then go at defective batteries which might explode. So, they have uh, on their website, they document which batteries are defective and offer you a replacement. Uh, also, thermal paste after a certain number of years can wear out. So, this is paste you put behind the uh, the processor and um, uh, head sync to, to have better thermal exchange and uh, to make the computer less hot. Uh, so sometimes quality may vary where, depending on where you buy it because there are second hand computers. Uh, you also have to find Wi-Fi Bluetooth cards replacement, but uh, like ATH main cable, but uh, they are easy to find. Uh, uh, also, you probably want to change your hard disk because they are slow or and or small, uh, the ones uh, that are typically inside. Uh, you might want to increase the RAM and on some device where you can plug a um, uh, flash programmer, you might need to solder and it's preferable to do it lead free because there is lead free solder. Uh, so there is also other way to try not to uh, to break the device. There is a normal fallback map where you, you can test an image and if it doesn't boot, uh, at the next boot it will reboot on the known working image. So that's documented on the core boot wiki how to use it. Uh, as I said before, you have locks. So there is a lot of way to get locks uh, through a serial port. Uh, for instance, a computer like that, they have docks and a serial port connector. So when the computer boots, you see the locks on the serial port. Um, more recent computers got uh, the serial port removed. So they have USB port instead. And one of the USB ports can produce locks. So that's called USB debug. You can also add like some cards, some serial cards from uh, on mini PCI or PCI Express to get those. So um, yeah, you can also.
Expo gets logs from running systems, so yeah, and say what it does. Uh, and you can also save them to the flash chip. Uh, so. Uh, if you don't have supported hardware and you want to do a part that's much more complicated, but the Linux kernel typically has access to the information the BIOS export to it. So, like uh, the PCI bus hardware, the pin routed, and so on. So, all the necessary information is, uh, uh, most of the necessary information is available. So, there is even a um, software in core boot that can automatically port core boot to a system. It just gathers the log, the, the information, and generates codes. So then the user is supposed to flash it, and if something goes wrong, to refresh the original BIOS, for instance. Um, logs help a lot to understand what the problem is, and there is even a tool to understand what the BIOS is doing, but it's complicated to use. So on ARM devices, um, it works uh, very differently. You have like a chip with a, which has processor, graphic card, SD controller, and so on. Uh, so it has most of the system. It's called a system on a chip, and uh, there is like a hardware code, like ARM instruction inside the chip. So there is a ROM, and it starts from them from that node. That's called the boot ROM. And typically, it go fetch a bootloader from a micro SD card or things like that. So. And uh, so it can take that from micro SD card, SPI flash, 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 we really. saw so, uh, uh, EMMC, so, EMMC, and so on. So uh, typically the bootloader is configurable through pins, so the device manufacturer uh, sets some pins and it will set the bootloader. So unfortunately, most smartphones uh, have code signatures, so you can change the bootloader. So people typically make the confusion with the recovery, but the bootloader is the first program that um, starts. And when you want to install an operating system like Replicant, you ask the bootloader to let you install what you want, and it erases the data partition, for instance. So that thing, you cannot change it on most uh, smartphones. This is not the case on the on tablet, and there are very few exceptions for smartphones. Uh, well, it does more things or less things depending on the system on the chip. So, um, also the nice thing of that is that uh, a lot of time you can load software from USB. Uh, so if it, there is no code signature, you can easily mess up with the boot system and recover without risking to break the hardware. So only in software. Uh, so. Libre Boot also support Chromebooks, but I know less about it. Paul Koselkowski no more. Uh, so there are some which have good displays uh, that can be used for working. Uh, so uh, compared to ThinkPads, they have a free m controller, but they are soldered CPU, RAM, Wi-Fi, storage, and pretty much everything. So you, you cannot upgrade or change the Wi-Fi and since the Wi-Fi uh, requires non free firmware, it's not great. But uh, yeah, still the, they are supported by Parabola and uh, and, yes. um, and with the default setup, they also uh, have some security. But I guess that was removed for uh, by Libre to make it easier to use. Uh, so that's all. That's uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, you recently made a laptop, and uh, SAPA didn't work very well on the last laptop uh, recently. Yes. Uh, can you explain a little more how the SAPA driver works on the Libre? Um, I don't know much about this issue because they just did a workaround. It worked, and they, yeah. They don't understand everything about it, so what they did is just they downgraded the SATA speed and it somehow how it worked, but uh, yeah. 
so Sata um, is, I don't know much about it, just that um, Corbut Librobut has to initialize it to be able for a software like CBIOS to load something from the hard disk, but that's pretty much it. Uh, other question? Uh, maybe if you come and do a queue like with Richard Stanley, it right. will be easier. And maybe if people who have, have questions. Okay. So, um, what is the main blocker for expansion of uh, uh, device list uh, Liverpool supports? Uh, and is there any piece of work that can be done to uh, improve the situation with the sub device support? And the main broker is the management agent, since uh, its code is signed um, and required to be executed to have a working laptop. Uh, we, LibreBoot cannot, uh, doesn't want to support device with uh, some part that are not free uh, and to, to boot, so that's really the blocker. And what can be done about it? Uh, um, that's difficult, uh, maybe pressuring Intel by making a uh, lot of hardware, uh, maybe making other architecture, uh, such as Power 8, Power 9, but these are more powerful computers, so not well suited for laptops, maybe uh, looking at alternatives such as ARM. There, there's no like simple answer, but yeah, it's unfortunate. Okay, so if I have an uh, uh, Intel management engine, uh, I can't install the Libre Boot, right? Or can I? It's just that uh, the, your machine will not be supported by Libre Boot. But uh, Core Boot supports such machine, but yeah. Uh, usually, for instance, it supports ThinkPad that are more recent and that have management engine. And the best you can do is to remove the code that's unnecessary. For instance, you can remove AMT and much of the code, but you still need code to initialize some of the hardware before the BIOS to be able to boot the machine. So, yeah, LibreBoot refused to support such machine, but then there is CoreBoot, but it's not uh, as much freedom as LibreBoot. Is it possible to use code signing to also protect your own computing devices? Like uh, on yes, on ARM, yes, but it's very unpractical. Like you're supposed to handle a PKI, uh, like not lose the private key and um, prevent people from accessing it. So very, 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 very few people are capable of doing this. For instance, I lost data, I'm not capable of doing that, so then you cannot change the code that's on your device, so it's really impractical. And um, you have some difficulties like um, changing the trust, like if you want to revoke trust, it's really not great for users. But uh, Raptor Engineering did a campaign some time ago with a core 8 system on crowd supply where they designed a security system that would allow to tinker with the security system and uh, provide some assurance that the code has not been modified. And so it would, it would have protected from uh, physical access from someone else than the system owner. So that might work, but they didn't, the campaign didn't succeed. And now they're making a new campaign, campaign with, uh, um, sorry, now they're trying to sell Power 9 uh, uh, device that might have the same features. So I guess we must wait a bit to see how that can be used in practice. And that system is documented on the crowd supply page. So you have some documentation, but I think it's the way to go. The other possible way is to have a system like Chromebooks, where you have to disassemble the laptop to to change it. So if someone can disassemble your laptop, 
Yes, you, you have to remove the school, but uh, you have to also disassemble the laptop to do that. So you, you have system, but it would be nice if uh, end user with our technical knowledge would be able to take advantage of it, and not only people with knowledge, uh, advanced knowledge. Uh, other questions? The code is signed. The code is signed. Can it be broken, and then a, a, a CPU would become uh, free to write what you want with the management engine and live it directly or something like that? Hmm? Uh, theoretically, yes. This has been done on uh, ARM system and chip, for instance, Freescale IMX. Um, but it would require you to be able to dump the instructions that are executed at boot. Uh, if there is a boot room in the management engine, like uh, there is ARM instruction in ARM systems, you need to dump that first, then to analyze it, to find security flows, and then you might be able to put whatever you want. So that would be a solution, but I think it would require more work because as far as I know, we don't have any code execution on the management engine. Uh, yet, on tourism website, there is uh, some documentation on some possible ways to uh, like circumvent the, the signatures or something like that. So, but I have not looked into it into details, so maybe through this way it's possible. I don't know. Uh, more questions? Uh, next speaker, I mean. <laughs> oh, maybe people with uh, kids. <laughs> Yes. Um, uh, I 
think it most flash chip would work. Uh, what's special is that uh, you have, for instance, uh, North Bridge, South Bridge, so you should check the South Bridge data sheet. That's for the open leader to still have North Bridge, South Bridge. Yeah, but you, you, you should check the, the data sheet anyway, or the PCH data sheet, uh, to see how, how much, uh, how, how big you can um, go, for instance, 12 megs, 6 megs, and so on, because that's usually the main interest in replacing it. Like, you want more space. Uh, and uh, there might be other constraints, but I guess trying is yeah. usually it works. So you have something called a flash descriptor at the beginning of the, it's like a partition uh, table for the yeah. flash. And here you have some settings. Uh, settings and the um, flash descriptor and some are related to, to the flash so you might have to adjust this. So there is a, a tool in Core Boot. Ah, well, uh, so there is a new tool called Block Tool. Yes, uh, one second. Yes, so you have just the, um, the fields and you, you can change them uh, with uh, Maybe we should pause the audio recorder or something like that. Who, maybe, I don't know who. Yeah, to make a new file because. Uh, it will be uh, easier, I guess. So this is, this is uh, technological. Uh, I didn't have time to disassemble to show that.